Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Basic Instinct, Managing Bias. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to attend this session. Our webinar is brought to you by the Kaleidoscope Group. My name is Barbara Sanner and I'll be your moderator today. Before we start, we wanted to let you know about submitting questions. To ask a question, simply type into the questions box of your GoToWebinar control panel where it says enter a question for staff and click send. We will ask your question to the presenters and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can, but we probably can't answer all of them today. So if we don't get to your question, we'll definitely follow up with you via email. Also, we hope that you'll take a few minutes to complete the survey at the end of the webinar. When you exit the session, the survey will appear in your browser window and it should take less than three minutes to complete. Your feedback is very important to us, so thank you in advance for doing that. Now I'd like to introduce Kevin Murphy, Junior Consultant for the Kaleidoscope Group, who will be handling our questions today, and our presenters, Suri and Kasha. Suri Surinder is the founder and CEO of CTR Factor, a business performance improvement firm providing advisory and execution services to growing companies. Suri recently joined the Kaleidoscope Group as Chief Learning Officer. Previously, he served in numerous C-level roles at Pfizer, Verizon, and other Fortune 500s, and was Managing Director of Global Transformation at Barclays. He has published multiple articles on leadership, diversity, and the global mindset. Surrey holds bachelor's and master's degrees in engineering and an MBA in marketing and resides in Fort Wayne, Indiana. With Surrey today is Kasha Ganko Rodriguez, a senior consultant and engagement leader for the Kaleidoscope Group. As an engagement leader, she partners with Kaleidoscope's clients on the strategic design and implementation of diversity and inclusion efforts. To date, she has guided and supported DNI efforts with clients such as Caterpillar, CDW, the Museum of Science and Industry, North Shore University Health System, and REI, among others. Originally from Warsaw, Poland, Kasia holds Master's and Bachelor's of Arts degrees from the University of Warsaw, and she now resides in Chicago, Illinois. So now I'll turn it over to Kasia to get us started. Thank you, Barb. Good morning, afternoon, or evening to all of you. We really appreciate you joining us for the hour and look forward actually to hearing from you via questions and hopefully follow up as well. Um, we're very excited to, um, uh, to talk about the topic that seems to be one of those hot topics these days, or maybe I should say hot topics if you prefer British English. Um, but in any case, we're very excited to have you all. Uh, just very quickly, let us introduce who we are. Um, uh, first, we are Kaleidoscope Group History. So let's take a look at the next slide, if we could, Barb. Um, we are a full-service diversity and inclusion consulting firm located uh, or headquartered in Chicago with um, uh, our colleagues, co-workers all across the United States as well as associates across the globe. And we truly uh, are passionate about this work. We Diversity and inclusion is all we do. Um, every day we try to also um, live that in our personal lives. Um, we're led by Doug Harris right now, whom uh, you might know, um, and we were founded by Bi Young, who is in her 80s, she still does yoga, stands on her head and says the world looks much better that way. So we're really um, uh, sort of, of uh, you know, ch we cherish our, our history and, and background from that perspective as well. Um, today we have assisted organizations um, around transformation and managing change uh, around culture for over 30 years. Okay, we like to show our team because everything that we do is a product of collective effort and collaboration. So let's take a look at our team. Um, Bar, please, with the next slide. A lot of good-looking people, but this may not be appropriate to say. So let me take that back. I'm from clearly a different country. Different things go differently, everybody, in different countries. Uh, but this is our great, great team. Uh, let's take a look at our client partner list as well, which is going to be a um, select list. Um, so uh, if you are from that uh, organization, we appreciate 
the partnership today. If you are not, we hope for the partnership, for, of course, and this is uh, not the list that includes all of our partners. So if you're not here, we apologize. This slide has limitations. So with that, let's take a look at how we're going to spend the hour. And um, uh, in today's webinar, we are going to explore essentially three aspects of bias, okay? Understanding what bias is, identifying uh, bias, and then managing bias. Um, of course, we're going to focus on unconscious bias, as, as you can see here. Um, also recognizing that unconscious bias is one type of bias. Well, actually, there are conscious biases that exist that we all probably have as well, and they are very uh, innocent sounding sometimes simply around what we like and what we don't like. But there's very often a bias attached to it as well. But today we will focus on unconscious bias. So let's take a look uh, with Suri at uh, the first aspect of that conversation. If you go to slide eight, uh, this gives you four scenarios. And my question to you, this is not a polling question, by the way. I want you to answer it in your own minds. Um, but the question I'm asking is, what would you do in this situation? I'm going to show you four pictures of subway coaches. Subway coaches, OK? And I want you to think of which subway coach you would pick if you had a choice, which one would be your highest preference subway coach to get into? You're riding the subway, okay? Barb, can we show the four pictures? There you go. So picture A, you can see what it's like. Picture B, you got kids dancing. Picture C, and then picture D. Now, take a second and think about which one you would pick. Remember that letter. Now, this is the point where I wish we weren't on this webcast and we were face-to-face, -face, because I would ask you your picks and I'd ask you the reasons for your picks, okay? Um, now, uh, since we're not, and we're, we are limited in terms of, you know, uh, muting your phones and so on, um, I'm going to tell you the results that we typically get, okay? And then you can match it up to what you picked. Um, a few people end up picking A, even though it's extremely crowded. And the reason for that is if you have been ever mugged on the subway like I have in New York, I was in New York 15 years, um, I got mugged on the subway twice. And on both occasions, it was in a very empty car. Uh, it had a couple of people in it, but they didn't come to help me. And so I learned after that experience that being in a crowded car isn't such a bad thing. Uh, you might still end up you know, losing your wallet, but at least you won't lose your life. And so, you know, some people pick A for the security of A, okay? Some people pick B because they say it's interesting. I see some kids dancing around, it's entertaining. A lot of millennials, by the way, pick B. Uh, a lot of baby boomers tend not to pick B uh, because, you know, it's too much activity, it makes me a little nervous, you know, I, don't, I just want to relax on my way to work or way back home. Some people pick C, and the reason they pick C is there's only one person, it's well lit, the person is dressed reasonably well, you know, I can't tell if there's any nefarious motives. So, but relatively few people pick C. A lot of people, by the way, pick D. Again, reasons being well lit, uh, the seats are sideways, so you can see the entire car, the seats seem comfortable. It's not just one person spookily staring in the distance, it's got three people in it, and so people feel a little more comfortable. It's not extremely crowded, it's not extremely, you know, with just one person, it's got a few people and they end up picking D. Regardless of the choice that you picked, and in today's audience, you know, I'm sure there's 208 people, all of you pick different choices, you had a reason for picking it. And my point to you is, you came to that decision in a split second. It didn't take you a long time. In, exhibit, in making that decision of the subway coach that you would enter, you have exhibited bias without even realizing it because your mind has made a very quick computation in terms of your natural preferences and of your, des your desires for safety, and you picked a choice. That is bias. We make hundreds, thousands, sometimes millions of these decisions without even thinking about it on a daily basis. And that's what bias is all about. So when you answer the question before, 40% said often and, and most of the time, you know, you guys are probably more correct. Um, you know, in terms of the frequency of exhibiting bias, it is a lot more than you might think. And bias is not, is not necessarily a bad thing. In this case, it helps protect you. It helps give you an environment where you feel comfortable. If you go to the next slide, 
um, I'm going to show you an example of, of exhibiting bias that will make you think twice about whether bias is good or bad. Okay, uh, And here, by the way, in, on this slide, the question being asked is, who would you hire? And you're going to see six hiring situations, Okay, six positions that you're hiring for. And again, in your own mind, in your own mind, uh, I want you to think about which of the two options would pick to hire for these slots, okay? Which of the two options, for every position you'll have two options, I want you to think about which option you would pick uh, for each position. So let's reveal the, uh, the pictures. So there you go. So the first, the first um, uh, one, uh, question one is marketing, um, um, you know, uh, marketing director. And you see two pictures, right? Think about who would you pick. The next one, number two, is trainee. Then the next one, um, uh, number three, is um, bank director. Number four is PR representative. PR is public relations. Number five is nurse. And number six is construction manager. So you have six positions, two options for each position. I'm going to give you just a couple seconds to think about and keep track of you know who you think you would pick. Okay, now let me tell you the answers that we normally get. Okay, and you might differ from this, but 95% of the people pick the following options here. For marketing director, people pick B. For a train for trainee, people pick B. For bank director, most people pick A. For PR representative, most people pick A. For nurse, most people pick A. And for construction manager, most people pick A. Okay. Now, this we've done this test in multiple occasions, multiple audiences. The results are amazingly stable. For marketing jobs, somehow, because people think about internet marketing, social marketing, people pick the younger person. So there's a generational bias. For trainee, people pick the person that looks more mainstream. So there is potentially, I don't know what you would call it, but a mainstream bias. You know, uh, For bank director, people pick the older white gentleman. So there is an age bias and, and, a, and a, um, also a gender bias. For PR representative, people tend to pick the fully abled person. Now, a few people have said to me, I would pick the person in a wheelchair because, you know, number one, that disability will not get in the way. In fact, it might help with public relations because the person is more uh, relatable and accessible. So some people pick B because of that reason, but a lot of people pick A for that. For nurse, most, most people pick A because we're more accustomed to seeing female nurses, a bit of a gender bias. And then again, construction manager, most people pick A, the, the, the man versus the woman. Now, I don't know if you guys picked the same choices or not. Chances are a lot of you picked the same choices. My point is this. On the previous slide with the subway, our biases, which were unconscious, helped us pick a safe and secure choice. On this slide, the same biases might lead us to a suboptimal choice. There is no reason why the older gentleman wouldn't be just as good or better than the younger person for the marketing director job. In fact, his experience might count in his favor. Okay, There is no reason why the person that looks like an Arab you know, wouldn't be better as a trainee than the person who, with the vest who's more mainstream, okay? And so this is the point that I wanted to make to you. We all have biases. We exhibit them all the time, okay? Uh, the biases may be good in some occasions and bad in some occasions, so we, we need to be able to distinguish between those situations, and we just need to be aware of what biases we're exhibiting so that we can manage them. That is really the, uh, the, the point. Uh, behind these exercises, okay? So having said that now, we're going to launch into a deeper dive into what bias really is. And for that, I'm going to turn it back to my colleague, Kasha. Thank you, Suri, and thanks, everyone. Um, hopefully, you are still with us. Um, so let's talk about really what the bias, uh, what bias is, um, especially that we have a lot of definitions out there floating in social sciences as well as business. So we'd like to offer a business definition or one that we utilize in our work, which is as simple as preference for or against, a preference for or against. And what you see underneath that is a set of different dimensions of diversity. And the reason why we show that in conjunction with that definition is that our biases can revolve around all those different things underneath. 
as well as be triggered sometimes by our experience with uh, any of those dimensions. Um, you know, our culture is like air, my friend says. Um, we don't even know when we breathe it in, and I say that a lot of times it's very polluted. And I know in my background, I've received messaging, wrong messaging that I had to um, uh, sort of, um, uh, uh, I would say, both valid, would ch change eventually because it was creating biases. Um, now, an interesting business application of that, you will see, for example, biases that we don't often even think about exist around style. So we oftentimes, I think, talk about primary. Um, issues or biases around those, maybe even secondary, but so often I come across across biases in the business world related to that which we don't even treat as a bias. For example, uh, oftentimes I see how there is a preference around putting um, intro, extroverted people in client or customer facing positions um, and, for example, believe that introverts uh, will not do well in sales, which naturally both is a bias and a misconception. But just alerting us that biases can really exist around all of those dimensions. Now let's talk about why. Why that is the case that bias is so prevalent. And part of it, if we could take a look at the next slide, please, Barbara. Um, part of it is the fact that we're just wired this way. So it's an evolutionary thing. Uh, we're wired to have biases. The brain operates in that way. But also it's simply because it's almost impossible not to rely on unconscious processing. So 11 million, that stands for the bits of information that we receive every day or every moment, really, by um, um, so our brains receive that many bits of information, if you will. Um, now, we only process consciously 40 bits of information every moment. So think about how much information is actually processed unconsciously. And that really comes down to most of it, 99.999 so forth, is the percentage of unconscious processing of data every moment by the average human brain, which then simply creates a fertile soil for a whole lot of biases that go unchecked and unvalidated. Now, um, why are we also talking about bias? How is this impacting um, our uh, business world, our world in general? Let's take a look at the bias impact with the next slide. One thing about bias impact is that bias, and we've talked about this already, is relative. So uh, it may be good or bad, and it has this for or against component. And within those two types of biases, if you will, or um, I would say dimension aspect of bias, you can have impacts that are both positive and negative. Let me give you a couple of examples. So uh, if you have a preference for, if we have a preference for that has a positive impact, it's for example, um, existence of company values and mission and vision. So it's a positive thing for a company to say, here are our values and we want all employees um, to truly abide by them, right, and internalize that. So it's a positive bias or a bias for that has positive impact. Now a bias for that has negative impact um, is, is one that, um, for example, you might recognize in your work environment. It's when we gravitate towards similar traits, towards similar backgrounds, similar people, similar thinking style. Um, some of you may have uh, come across the term like me bias, right? So why it is a preference for, all we do is gravitate towards like me people, inadvertently we stay away from that which is different. So that's why it has a negative impact to it. Now bias against, even though it says against, it actually can have a positive impact. So I have a strong bias against injustice, right? Um, for example, against unfairness, um, and that's sort of, hopefully the positive impact of that is diversity and inclusion of work and wanting to uh, change the world in a positive way. Now, naturally, bias against that has a negative impact. You, uh, you've heard of it. Extreme case of that being discrimination um, or any type of unfairness that we come across. So hopefully that clarifies uh, different aspects of bias in terms of impacts. Let's take a look at a more business type of area of, of bias application. So in our um, business lives in, 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 at work, naturally we have personal decisions and they're sometimes as simple as uh, what am I going to eat for lunch? Is it Coke or Pepsi, coffee or water? Um, is it also, am I going to stay in this company? Am I going to leave? Do I see myself long term? Which job I want to apply for and move on? Um, that's one aspect, right? So our preferences will kick in in that space. The second application of bias is run to, um, let's take a look at Barbara, the second piece, please. 
uh, re relationships. So in the in the in the workplace, that has to do with who am I really listening to and how? Um, who am I choosing to seek opinion and advice from? Um, what um, or, or what type of backgrounds am I actually uh, consciously um, leveraging into uh, and, and sort of seeking out for my networks and for my um, teams? Okay. In terms of talent, which is going to be the next application, it's all people processes. So how we recruit, um, how we hire, how we select, whom we develop. Um, like me bias again kick in I uh, can kick in in any of those decisions around talent and finally business decisions who do I choose to give an award uh, to who gets high exposure project who gets uh, to be included into meetings with exposure to high caliber executive right um, so all of those decisions that we make daily can be impacted by bias now let's take a look with story at the research um, and that shows really how pervasive those impacts can be. Hey, thanks, Kasha. Um, uh, by the way, I do see a comment. I, I, before I address the slide, I see a comment from a person that says a picture does not provide enough information, and that's an awesome comment. So um, I won't mention the name of the person who said that, but uh, you know who you are, and you're right. But how often does our does our mind, our unconscious mind, make a decision based on a picture, based on a person's appearance? It happens much more often than we think. And the fact that we are recognizing that just a visual image does not provide enough information takes whatever unconscious biases we have and brings it into our consciousness. And so that's a great question to ask, and I wanted to acknowledge that comment. By the way, continue to ask questions. I'm monitoring the question box here, and I'll make sure we answer any questions or comments you have. On the impacts of bias, hey, I'll just say this. There are multiple impacts of bias that we, we don't think about, okay? NBA referees, for example, it's been proven statistically. NBA referees call fouls on players from a different race than themselves significantly more often then they call fouls on players from the same race as themselves. NBA referees in general, okay? Um, uh, if you are dressed up in a bus in business attire, you're going to get through security at the airport 50% faster than you would if you didn't, uh, if you were just regularly dressed. Again, proven through studies, okay? So there are several impacts of bias, but this slide talks about a specific job-related impact where they did a computer simulation of eight levels in a company, level one through level eight. They started off with a 50% 50-50 gender split at every single level, which is the slide that you see, orange and blue, a 50-50 split. Women are uh, orange, men are blue. Then they programmed in 15% attrition at each level, and the attrition was replaced from the level below. So all of the attrition was replaced by promotion based on performance score. The performance scores themselves are randomly distributed except for one difference. There was a 1% performance score bias towards men and against women. So men on average got 1% higher performance scores than women. That was the only uh, introduction of you know bias here. Um, a simulation was conducted multiple iterations and look at what happened when when this simulation was conducted multiple times. What happens to the composition of the people as you approach the top of the organization? Instead of a 50-50 the way we started it is now a 35-65 in favor of men. A 1% bias 1% bias in performance scores creates such a big difference in the composition at the top. Uh, and so we wanted to illustrate this point through this uh, computer simulation. Um, doesn't mean that this happens at every company, but we need to be aware of the impact of a small piece, a uh, small percentage of bias. Next slide uh, then talks about. Um, um, I think we're now into identifying bias. So we have finished the part about sort of uh, understanding bias. Obviously, if there are any more questions, Kevin, I'll be open to that. Do you see any other questions in the box? Yeah, thanks, Suri. Um, one person said that beyond um, people decisions that can be made with an overconfidence bias, um, there's also business decisions that are affected. So I thought that was an interesting point, like how um, like kind of an overconfidence bias can, can impact business decisions. 
Yeah. A absolutely. That's a very good point. And, and there are multiple biases that impact people and impact processes and decisions. So, and I won't go into all of them, but uh, some cost bias, for example, is a great example, or recency bias is a great example of uh, something that might impact business decisions, uh, where you know you focus more on it, it continuing to invest money. It's not a people decision, but it's an investment decision. You continue to invest money in an area where you have already put in a lot of money and not succeeded. Okay, so there are multiple biases like that. It's a fascinating topic, but that's a great comment for all of us to remember and learn from. But to continue on that comment, let's talk a little bit on slide 18 about six types of biases. We're not going to address all six, but these are very common types of biases that impact our thinking, whether it's about people or about business. And we're going to actually talk to three of these. Okay, the first three, diagnosis, value attribution, and attentional. So when you go to slide 19 um, and, and you look at the diagnosis uh, bias example on slide 19, Barb, um, so it's a diagnosis bias is a propensity to label people, ideas, or things based on our initial opinion of them. So you're diagnosing it a certain way based on an initial opinion. You see two pictures here, and if I were to ask you the question, which of these two gentlemen would you rather date or get your you know, uh, daughter, sister, friend to date, um, chances are, chances are most people would pick the person on the right. Uh, again, because we're diagnosing things based on initial appearance. If you actually reveal who these people are, Barb, if you can do the build on this, the person on the left is John Fetterman, mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania, uh, highly accomplished. The tattoo on his arm is a zip code. That's how much he likes where he lives. Master's degree in public policy from Harvard. Really doing marvelous stuff on a municipal government front. Um, so very accomplished. Uh, and then on the right, the person on the right, and some of you may know this already, is Ted Bundy. And so, the, the, again, the point here is we have a natural propensity to label people's ideas or things based on initial opinions. And if, if the question is, so what, uh, you know, the so what here is do not jump to conclusions on people. Have alternate hypotheses around people, always. And if you find yourself thinking a certain way by, by watching somebody, Question your own judgment, okay, and 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 so yeah, question your own thinking because that's very important to avoid uh, this type of bias. The next slide talks about uh, the second type of bias, which is value attribution. So, um, you know, we tend to uh, imbue people with certain qualities based on the value which is slightly different from the previous bias, okay? But here, we have a certain perceived value of people, and so we tend to imbue them with other qualities based on that perceived value. And this was an experiment done by MIT um, in two cities, in Boston and Chicago, and they actually sent out, uh, they responded to real job ads um, for executive uh, assistants, and for sales associates. So there were two types of roles, executive assistants, administrative assistants, and sales associates. There were real job ads, but the resumes that were sent out were fake. But all the resumes that were sent out were identical in terms of credentials, experience, qualifications, background, very, very similar. Um, except for one set of resumes had these names on them, Brendan, Greg, Emily, and Anne. And the second set of resumes, Barb, if you can open up, uh, build the slide, the second set of resumes had these names on it, Tamika, Aisha, Rashid, and Tyrone. And what they found was for the first set of resumes, they got a callback once every 10 resumes that went out on average. On average, they got a callback once every 10 resumes. For the second set of resumes that were identical in every way except for the names, they got a callback once every 15 resumes. Again, this is where unconscious bias comes in. Unconscious bias is not easily discoverable because people will deny it till the cows come home. But it does show up in outcomes and impact. And the impact here, not the intent, the impact here is that it takes a 50% higher level of effort to get a response to a resume that has an ethnic sounding name versus a more mainstream sounding name. That is the impact. And so, uh, the idea here is that there's lots of experiments like this conducted to identify biases, but this is a great example 
of that experiment, okay, uh, of one such experiment on value attribution. The next slide talks about attentional bias, and I'm not going to go over the video this time, uh, partially because I think, you know, the platform may not may make the video a little bit choppy, and also we're running out of time a little bit, so I want to make sure we cover the rest of the content. But uh, this is available on YouTube. I'm not going to give away the story here, but you can go and check in YouTube for the awareness test. Just type in awareness test and follow the instructions of the video, and it'll be very, very enlightening. It'll ask you some questions, ask you to watch the video, ask some questions, and um, I want you to see how many of you get the answer to the question right. Okay? And again, the idea here is that when we're focused on something, we tend to miss lots of things that are surrounding that item of focus. And so that creates attentional bias because of our intense focus on one thing. Um, so let's let's go ahead and, and uh, share a little bit around what we have found might be ways to um, to ex to challenge your personal bias that begin with this notion of examining. So examining or four E's of challenging personal bias. So examining the first E is really around doing that self work, and we could do two type of things. So we can take some tests, and they're also available online, such as implicit association tests that can be extremely thought-provoking, maybe even shocking for some of us to sort of uncover some of the biases that we either wish we didn't have or think we don't have. But sometimes we can have subtle ways in our environments that give us a, a, a sort of a cue around possible biases. So um, uh, irritations that we may experience in the workplace, discomfort when working with different individuals, different styles. Uh, uh, incidents kind of can give us a clue for our preference for foreign games. Um, I had that happen to me a couple of years ago when I was experiencing all those different reactions in a, a work relationship with someone who has a very different style than mine. You can tell probably by now I'm very expressive, um, I tend to be extroverted, um, and I prefer naturally people that are also very expressive. And that was a person with very direct style and more restrained type of um, style. And I had a challenge. I, I was getting sort of irritated or frustrated sometimes in those interactions. So I began this work and I also sought to explore how I'm showing up as a result of the bias. So once I realized I have a particular bias, I realized that that impacts my behaviors and um, how what I uncovered was actually trying to avoid that person in my work relationship. So I started uh, assigning tasks and projects to somebody else until I caught really that bias in action. I evaluated the impact and actually the impacts there were simply I was not letting the other person um, obviously grow and develop on the job because I was truly going to my go-to network that was like me. And so with that, I sort of went to the fourth place of electing to change that bias. And um, one being simply, and underneath that is the belief that, right, maybe expressiveness is, is better because you sort of know where people stand. So that was one mindset shift that I had to do. But also, I pay a lot more attention right now in how I um, ascribe work and how I interact with others so that I can catch my natural bias in action. So this is just a personal example of how we can do this work in terms of challenging personal bias. Let me pause right here and turn it over to Kevin. Are there any additional comments or questions, Kevin, that you're monitoring that we could address right now? Yeah, thanks, Kasha. Um, so there was a really great question that came out. It said, um, one person was struggling with lack of accountability of leaders that do not self-identify themselves as facilitating the perpetuation of disparities. Um, it's a mouthful. So they said, how do you get the targeted leaders to self-identify as having bias that can lead to some of these disparities in employment and promotion? Like, how do you really get, um, get like, leaders on board and realizing that they, too, have biases that are affecting some of these workplace issues? What a phenomenal question. So I'll start, and Suri would love to hear from you, of course, as well. as I, try. I think that that is a million-dollar question. And when you think about change, and I think that's what we're talking about, change. So first of all, let me just preface it by saying what actually Doug Harris, our leader, says. Nobody likes change except for a wet baby is what he says, and I think some, some babies with wet diapers don't even like change. So first it's recognizing that it's not an easy process or one that people just wake up to do. You know, we don't wake up in the morning saying, I'm just going to uncover all biases that I have and eradicate them. 
um, that's probably not what's at the top of our agenda. So that's one thing. It's going to be hard. The second thing is how you inspire people then to go through this process. And different people will get inspired to go through that process for different reasons. Some will say, probably many of you out here, wow, you know, I want to do the right thing. I want to um, uh, sort of uh, show up in most effective ways on the job. Let me sort of see what gets in the way of my effectiveness. Others will not be prompted or motivated to do this work unless they see impacts of their behaviors. And what I find in my work when I advise others is to process that through questions. So if I were, for example, to see a bias that is uh, systemic in an organization, I would use questions um, that would uncover the impacts of certain behaviors versus call people out, which I know the person is not suggesting in their question, on their biases. Because whenever we go to the place of maybe even insinuating that somebody else might be biased, we probably will get defensiveness and pushback. But if we talk about observable behaviors and impacts on the business, we get more buy-in. So that would be my answer, and I think that's a phenomenal question. Suri, what would you add, or maybe you would change anything in what I said? Yeah, and I, I think yeah, no, I think uh, everything that you said would apply, Kasha. There, there are specific techniques that we can take you through in a separate session on how to address the issue of unconscious bias as you see it. But a lot of the things Kasha is saying are right on the money. The other thing I would say is never do it in public, always in private. Uh, the, another example of how to address it is not to make that person the center of the conversation, but to address examples from other instances that lets the person connect the dots. Uh, so, you know, that's why some of these sessions are very useful. So even if you see a, a, a blatant instance of bias and our instinct is to run to it and prevent it, sometimes it's better to educate about bias in general and let people connect the dots themselves. And again, approaching the topic from a uh, position of inquiry rather than advocacy. If somebody sees you coming on strong as an advocate for eliminating bias versus an inquisitive observer being curious about things, the reaction is going to be different. This is a highly sensitive topic. A lot of this stuff is done by well-intentioned people, by the way. They don't have malintent. People just don't realize. And I should say we don't have malintent because this is not a us versus them. All of us have this beast in us. And so surfacing it in the right manner is very important. Thank you so much for the question. We, we definitely will have time to answer uh, one, maybe even two more questions, so kindly uh, send them. We are moving right now actually to the last portion of our conversation. And, and with that question, thank you, you gave us a great segue into managing bias. Because ultimately it's not just about, which is not, not important, but uh, identifying, understanding bias, but really what, how can we manage it on that systemic level? And we believe that bias is a key driver of inclusion. And when you think about managing bias, uh, I'm sorry, managing bias is a key driver of inclusion and having bias actually gets in the way. There are three components. So one is around mindset, right? Um, which is simply around uh, recognizing both that bias can, be, uh, can have negative impacts, but also uncovering our own mindset around potential biases then it takes change in behaviors and skills and in processes. So let me give you a, a, an example. Um, a lot of organizations that I work with uh, tend to have a bias around particular schools. So those schools will shift depending which geographic region I am in and which you know, client partner that is, but it will be simply a preference for hiring or recruiting from certain schools. And there's a deep belief around that which is in a mindset portion of that, that only that school produces the right type of talent for us as an organization. So we can't even address this bias until we almost expand people's viewpoints around the fact that different schools can bring equally as desired and uh, you know, relevant talent. What behaviors then need to be then managed around that is even in the interviewing process. So sometimes I hear that certain hiring managers will not even want to interview someone who does not come from a particular type of um, school, right? Or they will discount that um, interview from a get go. So this is part of the managing bias around behaviors. And processes it, that would involve being very conscious and casting, right? And that much wider than your historical schools where you have a relationship. So that's just one example of how managing bias takes those three different levels. Let's take a look at additional strategies and Suri will take us through those. 
thanks, Kasha. So, uh, you know, Kasha mentioned a few strategies uh, for managing personal bias, right? So the four E's, examine, explore, evaluate, and elect. Those are strategies that we can use to challenge ourselves and to manage our own biases. There was a question around how do we uh, address people who are exhibiting biases, which is a great question. This slide addresses a third question. How do we systemically address bias in organizations? So this, this slide is not about necessarily ourselves. It's not about other individuals per se, but it's about companies and organizations. What are strategies we can use to address bias in large organizations? And there are three strategies, and we can open the slide up, Barb. We don't have to reveal this gradually. But essentially, the first set of strategies is around addressing beliefs. The second is around addressing thoughts. And the third is around addressing actions. Okay? To address beliefs, we have to reduce personal biases in the people around us. To address thoughts, we have to reduce decision biases. And to address actions, we have to reduce behavioral biases. So those are the three strategies. How do we accomplish that? Through capacity enhancement, capability enhancement, and culture enhancement. What do we mean by that? There are some very specific techniques. Again, unfortunately, in an hour seminar, we cannot take you through all this. But there's a ton of literature we can point you to. There's tons of books articles, white papers, research done on this, uh, and we have a lot of content that we would love to provide you, okay? But under capacity enhancement, you can see three specific strategies. Uh, Data-driven debunking is one example where, uh, you know, if people say, for example, well, you know, I think we're perfectly fine in terms of, you know, uh, gender representation in this company. I don't know why people are complaining. If you point out data uh, that, that refutes that statement, it's very difficult to, to come back at data. And what we have found often is that's why we show you real research data from experiments versus just talking about bias in general. So getting data in the picture and saying, let me show you how your thinking is different from what the data is showing us. What are your thoughts? Okay, so data-driven debunking is a great example of reducing personal biases through capacity enhancement. I'm going to talk about two other other strategies from this list that are highlighted in blue, objective decisioning and microprocess reengineering. So if we go to slide 27, let me talk to you about objective decisioning. Uh, there is a way in which your company, your organization, can build in objective decisioning into its processes better than what it's doing today. There is a science to this. Uh, we are very steeped in that science. If you need for us to come in and do an assessment and tell you where you can do that, we'd be happy to. But you don't have to hire us. But all I'm saying is think about the nation's premier orchestras who found themselves with 5% women in their ranks a couple of decades ago. And, and in order to get more women in their ranks, started using a more objective decisioning process around recruiting for the orchestras that involved one strategy, only one strategy, blind auditions. As a result of blind auditions, um, you know, they found that the odds of a woman advancing beyond the first round out increased by 50%. And today, when you look at outcomes, the percentage of women in the nation's premier orchestras has climbed to 35%. So my, my, my challenge to you is, how can you potentially use something like this in your hiring processes, promotional processes, you know, uh, selection processes for projects, how can you introduce blind auditions? What do you need to take off of resumes? I can tell you, uh, large companies are doing it. Google's doing it. You know, a lot of tech companies are very much into fixing this issue. And a lot of companies are finding by removing the name of a resume, you remove any evidence of ethnicity or gender. By removing the uh, college name, if you have a bias towards Ivy League schools, as exists at Google, whose founders are from Ivy League schools, you know, you take out the college, you take out the year of graduation, so now you don't know the age of the person. You even might take out the, the, zip, the, the address and the phone number, so there's no geographic bias. There are ways in which you can take a resume, keep all relevant content, but strip it of any content that would result in unconscious bias. Uh, that's just one example, okay? But this is uh, you know, something you can build into your processes. Next slide talks about microprocess reengineering, and I'm not going to hit all of these processes. 
we're happy to provide you copies of this slide if you reach out to us after the session. But um, uh, I will point out one example. So if you look at the one that says the squeaky wheel, you know, sometimes people who self-promote tend to get ahead. That's a reality of it. Some of you may be shaking your head, some of you are nodding your head and saying, yep, I know that. And so how do you, how do you eliminate or mitigate the risks of the bias of listening to people who tend to self-promote? Well, one way to do that is introduce a microprocess change. It's just not a huge process change, microprocess change, that a regular mechanism for each team member to share what they're working on and their achievements. Build it into your uh, staff meetings where everybody writes up a paragraph and talks about their paragraph. So this way you're evening out the odds of just a couple of people hogging the limelight. Just one minor change. We have a list of a hundred microprocesses like these guys, exactly like this. It's awesome. So reach out to us and we have microprocess tweaks that you can apply to every, every part of your organization to change the behavior. Trust me. Small changes create huge uh, changes in outcomes. So let me take a look at, let me, let me uh, show you um, um, sort of our thinking around apl applying this conversation to, to the um, uh, workplace uh, dynamics and also taking leaders through um, applying managing bias. And what you see in front of you, which, which is partly um, uh, filled out for a reason given the time, are, uh, is a framework that will allow or allows leaders that we work with um, exhibit actions to address and manage bias in specific areas. So moving from left to the right, this is almost like a cycle of leadership, if you will, where leaders need to develop themselves, they need to lead a diverse team, they need to ensure fairness and equity and business outcomes. And bias can impact all those things underneath. And so underneath um, uh, the specific um, areas, you will find here sample bias management actions, right? So in terms of continuous development, uh, we suggest that leaders uncover their unconscious biases. They can, for example, take the test I mentioned earlier. In terms of inclusive leadership, um, we advise that they look at their uh, go-to network. And we often say that there's probably a go-away network that uh, we all might have in our uh, work environment. And there's a specific tool suggestion that, that we offer, and so forth, right? So ultimately, anytime we have any education, um, education without application is, is essentially entertainment. And so in order to see true change, we want to make sure that leaders are supported, and all individuals for that matter. This is not just for leaders. This is an example of a leadership framework. But that we give um, everybody tools and specific actions so that they can implement managing bias in their work areas. So let's wrap up, if we could, our conversation with just a quick um, overview of benefits. So we can go straight to that slide, Barbara, for key business impacts of managing bias. Uh, this is pretty self-explanatory, so I will not read those things to you. Uh, but ultimately, why are we talking about this in the context of the business? Uh, yes, we truly believe in the right thing to do, but also um, managing bias is simply good for the business. It's hard to get innovation if, if we don't manage biases for certain um, uh, viewpoints. So if you have groupthink, you probably will not innovate very well, uh, or group biases around many different things. And one of you mentioned in your uh, chat response that Kodak is a great example for that, where it was so focused on getting good in film that everybody else came up with digital, right? And so they're out of business from that, that uh, from that standpoint. So all that to say, managing bias is very good for business is just not the right thing to do, not only the right thing to do. So with that, we've got three minutes left. Um, if there are any other questions, Kevin, we could address them right now. Thanks, Kasha. So I got one that was interesting. It says, who's to say that one person's biases are more positive or negative than another? So what if a boss's biases are different than our own? How do we judge our own to be superior? So I thought that was an interesting one, if you could elaborate on that. Well, that is a deep question, and I don't think I can answer it within two minutes. In all honesty, I really want to ponder this question. I would say, and then Suri, you chime in, um, I would not, what I would probably shy away from is even putting biases on any type of um, evaluation system uh, to say, oh, this bias is better than the other ones, because I don't think that can be evaluated. Um, I think biases, if they have negative impacts, then they need to be addressed. And whether 
somebody's bias is less severe or more severe, I don't think even that is necessarily constructive in terms of uh, creating change. But I think this question is so broad, and if I could, I would love to unpack it more. But that's my quick response. Um, it probably is not the satisfactory. Suri, would you add anything? Yeah, you know, the the only thought I have is, you know, what are your criteria for determining, you know, uh, for determining the validity and the appropriateness of a bias? Um, and, and let's start there. Is your criterion equity? Is it efficiency? Is it effectiveness? Is it economy? So, I mean, you, you have to think about what criteria are you using? Now, when thinking about business decisions, I would say look at the impact or the outcome of whatever biases are being exhibited, and are those outcomes optimal for the enterprise? So if your boss has a bias that's different from yours, and it's resulting in good results for the business, then I would say, well, maybe, maybe there's merit in you considering changing your point of view, okay? But at the same time, if you're focused more on equity, you say, well, wait a second, it isn't fair, it isn't equitable. Well, that's a different criterion to evaluate it, you know? So I would say, based on the criteria that you use, you need to come to a, you know, a, an evaluation of which biases might be appropriate and which biases might not be. By the way, I will also point you to some other resources on this topic. There are a few books you can get on your Kindle. Uh, there's a book called Blind that's awesome. Uh, so take a look at that blind spot. It's by two authors, um, and I, I won't go over the names, but uh, it's um, basically it's uh, I think it's Mazarin Banerjee and Anthony Greenwald, but it's blind spot. You have another book called Everyday Bias by Howard Ross, and the the the, the third book I would recommend is The Secret Life of Decisions. It's an awesome book about how unconscious bias subverts our judgment. The Secret Life of Decisions. Uh, and it happens to be by a paisan of mine from India, so I'm biased, you know, towards that myself. Mina, Mina, Mina Thuresingham. But uh, take a look at these three books. There's tons of resources on the web, folks. You just have to type unconscious bias in Google. You'll have 50 articles. So if you're really interested, we can provide you, by the way, a list of the articles and the books. But it's easy to find, you know. But but uh, that would be my comment. So we are out of time for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Sari and Kasha, for an insightful presentation. We hope that you all enjoyed it. And please do fill out the survey once you exit the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.